ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Dying Time is here. That's right, we're talking Freddy vs. Jason. Still on Kill by Kill. Well, greetings and salutations, Internet. Your old pal, Patrick Hilton, coming to you once again from both Camp Crystal Lake and 1428 Elm Street. This is the Kill by Kill podcast where we're dedicated to celebrating the least discussed component of any horror film, the characters. And we're going to unpack all the goriest of details of Freddy versus Jason in the hopes that a soon-to-be-departed teen's untimely end is just the beginning of the jokes that we can make at their expense. And as always, there's only one person I trust that if she is in a deep coma, she will point me towards some drugs. The one, the only... Gina Radcliffe, how are you doing today, Gina? I'm good. I'm armed with my turkey baster size syringes. <laughs> they are comically large. Yeah, you don't. You're not going to see you, you, these things are so large. You expect when they when they hit the plunger, it's going to make a little sound. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, they 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 film. They seem to be filmed uh, with um, uh, Pepto Bismol. Um, yes. Yeah, I don't know what medication that is, but <laughs> I don't know what it is either. But it, it it somehow works on Jason Voorhees's non-existent nervous system. That is a little wacky do. Yeah, there's uh, a couple. There's some uh, a few questionable decisions in this in this uh, in this segment. Yeah, that's why I didn't want to go too far because I have all sorts of questions about it. But before we go too far with that, Gina. I want to give it to you straight. I don't want to scare you, but we are not alone. That's right. We have a special guest. He's the editor at large of Talk Film Society, and he's the host of the Monsters Never Die podcast. The one, the only, Matt Curione. How are you doing today, sir? Hey, that's me. I'm doing pretty good. How you doing? (laughs) Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us for this tiny but uh, packed section of Freddy vs. Jason. I'm excited. This is uh this is a good movie actually. <laughs> <laughs> it's on the gooder end. That's of... my that's my hot take on this. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, listen, there's there's a uh, there's a weird line in the sand. I do find it entertaining and it's it's professionally made and <laughs> there's plenty of weird details and interesting characters uh and some fun gory deaths. Yeah, I mean, I don't hate it. Um, do I hold it close to my bosom and say, this is what I want to watch? I no. No. <laughs> no. But that, that, listen, the good news is that Friday the 13th and, and Nightmare on Elm Street, like, that's a buffet. Like, who cares if you like uh, uh, crab legs and, and I like London broil? Like, everyone gets what they want. There's a little something for everyone here. Absolutely. Now, uh, our little tradition here on the Kill by Kill podcast is we like to ask our guests, where were you? When did you first encounter Freddy versus Jason? And were you, in fact, excited about it like everyone else we've talked to? Uh, Yeah, I was very excited. I grew up watching these both series. And I saw this on a very awkward first date and last date, for that matter. Oh, my. (laughs) Uh, <laughs> so it was both. It was a combo. It was a, it was a yeah. mash em up. Okay. We never spoke again, and that's fine. <laughs> it's fine. He was weird. It's whatever. Uh, uh, well, but happens. yeah, the, I had fun with the movie, and uh, yeah, opening night is when I saw this. <laughs> okay. First. Excellent. <laughs> and what part of the country were you in? Like, what was the environment? Was it a jazzed audience? Were they all in your vibe? Or were they more like your date? Oh, they were all into it. Uh, this okay. was this is small town New Jersey, and it was a packed screening, and the audience was flipping out. They were having a blast. Now, are you in um, what part of New Jersey are you in? Because Gina is from Jersey as well. Okay, and I spent some time in the Garden State. I live in Tom's River. You, oh, oh, okay, really. Well, I you're once, in the same town I saw Doctor Giggles in. Nice. I once <laughs> I once kicked Snooky out of my restaurant, so that's where I'm from. <laughs> Excellent. You're near Manasquan. Yes. Yeah. About ten minutes, I, maybe. I love Manasquan. I used to have a, a Squan T-shirt 
that I I, uh, overwore to the point it it just fell off of me. Uh, That's not interesting to anyone else but me. Okay. (laughs) So let's get into this section of Freddy versus Jason. Now, last time... Jason broke up a uh, a corn rave. Oh hell yeah! <laughs> and Lori's dad revealed himself to be the same villain we saw when we were first introduced to him. Not a, a real big journey from him. He's a very <laughs> obvious villain. Uh, but where it has left us is that we uh, open here on the brain trust. All right, first you got Lori. She's off her juice meds and on the case. Then you got Kia. If you've got a plan, she she doesn't like it already. Actually, she (laughs) thinks it's shit. She fucking hates everything. Uh, Then you have Will. He's like a baby chicken with Chandler Bing hair. Uh, We have Linderman uh, on Data Dork. You always swipe right on him. And of course, Freeberg. And here we just say no to Freeberg. Freeberg sucks. Always say no to Freeberg. (laughs) (laughs) And finally, we have Deputy Stubbs. He frosts frosts like he wants his facts, just the tips, (laughs) ma'am. What do they know? Here's how they lay it out. They can't escape Freddy because, quote, we already know and fear him. He can just get us everywhere which would be a giant cannon change from Freddy Krueger's powers, which seem to have a, they end at the city line, at the city limits, like uh, dry, uh, like dry laws. Yeah. Oh, you you can buy beer on Sunday in this town, but not in that town. Not five feet away. Yep. So that's a, that's a big shift in how Freddy works. But then again, every movie has shifted how Freddy works. Gina, do you hmm. understand this? I, I I don't. I'm still I'm still stuck on the how did institutionalizing apparently dozens of teenagers is supposed to have you know, controlled Freddy and gotten the whole town to to quote unquote forget about him. And in fact, we're going to get even deeper into this murky subject the farther into it we go. But I. I found this, like, Freddy's free to follow you wherever. Like, now it's it follows. As soon as you're aware of Freddy, he can just go with you. That's not really how Freddy works. But again, this movie doesn't care and none of the other movies have cared. So why the fuck should I care? Yeah, I mean, you're asking a little too much at this point for these movies to be consistent. Yeah, that's not happening. (laughs) No, it just isn't. It just isn't. I But I like the simplicity thing. I I know I got to get over it. So Stubbs uh, walks in in the middle of Freeberg getting high. And of course, Freeberg much more worried about hiding his pot than this insane conversation they're having about a dream demon that's coming after them. And Stubbs says, okay, you don't need to worry about Freddy Cougar. What you really need to worry about is Jason Voorhees. And here's how he describes Jason's origin. Uh, He almost makes it sound like the same counselors who were supposedly responsible for Jason's drowning also beheaded his mom, which would be a very weird reading of the first Friday the 13th movie. <laughs> it's sort of like he watched the movie and, and but didn't quite remember everything that happened in it. <laughs> yeah, it's yes. a real compressed timeline. It's very confusing. Yes, like they just happened one right after the other and instantly you got yourselves a Jason. And there's no process to it whatsoever. He just, he drowned, but he didn't die. But then his mom died. And then he's like, you die. And what? What does this even mean? If I wanted shitty takes on Friday the 13th lore, you know, there are plenty of Facebook groups I could have gone to. You've come to to me. You've come to the right guy with with weird obsession with uh, Jason lore. Yes. I, I just don't, I don't. You got the right guest. (laughs) <laughs> no one quite understands it, but I think De- Deputy Stubbs understands it the least. And he's the one delivering the information, which I guess he got from police files. Yes, because Springwood would have police files on Crystal Lake for some reason. Yes. Well, apparently it's, it's within a, like a drive's length. Yes, you just hop in the car. But, I mean, that, that's, that's, definitely, that's definitely new information. Yeah, because apparently in like an hour you can drive from... Ohio to North Jersey, Northwest yes. Jersey. That's a thing you can do. I didn't know that. 
No. And the last time we saw Jason take that journey before this movie was previously in Jason Goes to Hell. So for Hell whatever yeah. reason, <laughs> when when Friday the 13th landed at New Line Cinema, they're like, the the world is elastic. Or he's bamfing, but they're driving. <laughs> like, they're in a van. There's like, are these two places next to one another now? It really does, it really does seem like they like they drove there in like an hour. Yes. Oh, it's still like the same night. It's the same night they saw one of their friends die. It's the same night that Lori's already fallen asleep once. <laughs> so it, it's one long ass night of of the corn rave. Yeah. And th- when what time did the corn rave start? Like dusk? It started I- at husk. <laughs> <laughs> ah. there we go <laughs> uh, and then someone says oh it's freeberg freeberg goes someone's really breaking the reality rules oh freeberg <sighs> what are you doing man i don't care for him <laughs> no <laughs> there's a lot of astounding statements made by characters in this as they try to grapple with wrestling all these different canon things and i guess in the end, I'm more interested in an entertaining movie than I am in, in the details. But the details are so wackadoo, they kind of kick you out of the movie on occasion if you know even the basest amount of both of the canons. Yeah, if you know anything about this, it's going to just confuse the hell out of you. Speaking of which, we have the astounding line. We've, we've kind of teased it for three episodes in a row, but here it is. Said out loud by Lori, she says... Freddy died by fire, Jason by water. How can we use that? As if they are, uh, they are Chekhov's kryptonite, basically, <laughs> is how she presents it. Like, ah, oh, we got to use fire and water. Come on, somebody, somebody, anywhere. Turns out no one's hearing this because she's actually in the middle of a dream sequence, one in which Kia says... What we should do is sacrifice a virgin to <laughs> Freddy, which is also brand new canon. Like, this is not something that has ever been presented in either Friday the 13th movie or A Nightmare on Elm Street that really virginity matters because it doesn't, and we've seen it dozens of times. You know, it's so funny that Kia is such a mean character. Like, even even when, like like, things are at their worst, she never turns it down. And, and it took me a couple minutes to realize, oh, she's dreaming this. Okay. <laughs> but it's because she's not in all any way, she's not in any way acting out of character. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't seem fantastical, right? It's not a giant leap that she's like, oh, why would why would Will want to sleep with you when he could fuck me? And you're like, okay, that's Kia. You're like, yeah, that sounds like something she'd say. All right. That's that Kia tracks. being Kia, y'all. <laughs> you know? This this is how she does it. And so they go over to tape her up, which, again, Freddy does not need someone confined, but uh, okay. Meanwhile, into the scene comes Lori's dad, or at least the dream version of it. And he um, he uh, sticks his tongue down <laughs> his daughter's mouth. It's disgusting. <laughs> in, it's unappetizing in almost every way. It's not cool. And I'm pretty sure by watching it on my computer that I am on a watch list. Yep. We're all on watch lists. If you own this movie, you are on a list somewhere. It's again, we're really overestimating the appeal of Freddy's tongue. Like it was cool once, but it's not the thing. Like if you were to list all the things that you have to have with a Freddy, I'm not sure tongue is even in the top 10 for me. What about you, Jaina? Yeah, no, I, I don't like the tongue thing. I, I, I don't like sexual Freddy. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I think I think that uh, that my distaste for that has grown exponentially since watching the remake. Yeah, yeah. That really puts you off. Yeah, it's, that movie did happen. Yes, it did. Wow, oh, I forgot about that. Jesus. Yeah. It is infinitely worse than this because it's, quote unquote, not your daddy's Freddy. But here is Lori's daddy as Freddy. And (laughs) it feels worse in the moment. It doesn't linger. The 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 bad taste does not last as long, but even still. So they're in the middle of this makeout session. 
Lori grabs what appears to be his cheek. It turns out to be Freddy's ear and then wakes up. Okay, we're back to Nightmare on Elm Street lore. If you grab something of Freddy and wake up, you can bring something out of the dream world into the real world. But with an ear, it turns into a lump of maggots? Gross. Uh, yeah, it's gross. gross. <laughs> ah, yes, you won that org- argument. <laughs> it's it's totes gross. But also, if you pull uh, Freddy's hat out of the dream world, you just get a hat. But an ear becomes maggots? How How exactly does that dream logic work? It's nightmare logic. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Okay. It's the it's the we don't know. It just looks cool magic. Basically, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah, I'll give you that one. Uh, and <laughs> this looks and, cool. All right, yeah, sure, yeah, do it. And then here's the line that I didn't remember because I was so astounded at the at, at the whole Freddy Fire Jason Water uh, logic line. But I think this might be even worse. Kia is unfortunately saddled with this one. Two killers. We're not a we're not safe, awake, or asleep. <laughs> Time out. You're not a uh, safe from Jason Voorhees when you're asleep either. Yeah, exactly. That's not a, it's not, it's not, he hasn't like uh, approached a person who's asleep and like, oh, 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 I'm gonna, oh, I'm well, gonna I'll, let you. Sleep. I'll get you later. It's fine. <laughs> you're, you're enjoying. Let you have your last nap. It's fine. All right. Yeah, I, don't, I don't want to. I don't want to wake you. I just want to machete you. Yeah. Just, just you sit there. That's fine. I'll get. I'll hit you back the next night. <laughs> okay. Just hit me up when you're ready. Uh, yeah, I guess. Sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. He just, he just leaves a note on your bedroom on your on your on your bedroom door. Sorry, we missed you. <laughs> <laughs> See you later. Yeah, when you're asleep, like I assure you, I will not kill you until the morning. <laughs> like, can I have your coffee first. It's fine. <laughs> I don't like that you beheaded my mom and I don't like that anyone stepped foot near uh, Crystal Lake, but I do abide the sanctity of a good night's rest. Yeah, there's like, a little PS at the end. Uh, this hurts me more than it hurts you. Don't worry. I'll see you. <laughs> that's right. If I'm going to kill you, I want you to be awake for it. Okay. That's the one thing I want as Jason Voorhees. Uh, but it's in this process that they learn about the fact that if Freddie can hurt you in when you're dreaming. If you stopped your dreams, perhaps he would not be able to reach you. This makes Lori ask, Will, how did you guys stop dreaming when you were in the nut hatch? And he goes, oh, 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 it was this uh, drug called Hypnocell. And so they look it up on the computer and it's a much nicer website uh, than we, what we were presented with in uh, Dream Warriors. <laughs> which looked like somebody had written it out on a Word document. <laughs> yeah. But I do got to say, I do like the callback of using Hypnosil again from yes. Dream Warriors. I think that's a really smart move on one of whatever 800 screenwriters this movie had. <laughs> it's it's one of those things where it's obvious that these people have watched these movies because there's too many callbacks for them yeah. to have not watched the movies. It's just that they can't keep them straight. And I guess I can't blame them because I'm not entirely sure I could keep them straight either. And I've kept copious notes over the last four fucking years. <laughs> so uh, that means that they need Hypnosil. And the one place they know they can get it is the Weston Hills Institute for Kids Who Witnessed Their Girlfriend's Mom Murdered by Her <laughs> Dad Good and Want to Do Other Things Good Too. And this is where we meet a security guard. Oh, this who goes guy. Unnamed, but uh, I think the best way I could describe him is that he looks like a bald Morton Joe. <laughs> okay. Yeah. <laughs> or maybe the Iron Sheik, but without the garb. <laughs> He's got one of those faces where you're like, I know this guy. But then you go to look him up and you're like, nope, I don't know this guy. <laughs> <laughs> he just looks like a guy that you've seen other people like in have real his life. Face. Yes. <laughs> I bet he was an and actual he, security guard. But where he is, the sort of security center of Weston Hills has more computers in it than the control room of Jurassic Park. Oh yeah. And yet and yet one person is overseeing it. A, a security guard. What so he's securing the computers? Is he securing the institute? 
What, what exact? Why do you give him a? Why is he checking on on doors? If he, you got that many computers in one fucking room, like, are you <laughs> launching missiles out of this motherfucker? What's happening? It's got that that favorite of horror movie tropes: the the inexplicably understaffed hospital. <laughs> and this is staffed by none one. Like, no one. He is the no only one. Ever, do we ever see any? Do we ever see any doctors at this place? Or, or not they, during or this these, section. Or are these like are these kids just kind of left in charge by like Laurie's evil dad and, the secu- and like one security guard? Pretty much, yeah. Well, th- the original section we have that one guy who has the valet case of drugs that he likes to inject in everyone's quote unquote cute butts. But oh right, yeah, crazy. He isn't seen in this section. I don't know why they didn't bring that person back because that seems like well, there's another dead body for you. To put on the pile, but for some reason he is completely forgotten. He's just a bad man who never gets his comeuppance at all, which seems like a real whiff and a miss. Like, would, did he come back in a in a deleted scene that I'm unaware of? Does anyone know? I don't know. I don't think so. Okay, no. so they just like fuck that guy. <laughs> we got security guy. Fuck that guy. Fuck those orderlies. We never want to see them again. Let's bring the security guard. No one's ever seen into the film. That'll make a lot of sense. I feel sure. bad for the security guard too, because it's like. He looks like he's like a schlubby, you know, he, he looks divorced. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like he's just like, he's just working this job to put his like, his large fail son through community college. <laughs> like I just, I feel bad for hospital guard, whatever his, ca- his credited part is. He probably, he probably, he probably doesn't know that, you know, this, this psychiatric hospital is warehousing kidnapped teenagers. Oh, he has no idea. He's just like, well, it's honest work. <laughs> Listen, if a dot shows up on the screen, I go look at it. That's my job. I don't really care about these kids. So bad for or, Yeah. Why is he guarding the ones who are asleep? It's super weird. It's just out of nowhere odd. And the he's one of the few is, people in this who's like actually doing his job. <laughs> and he gets well, killed for it. Yes. But Stubbs is. He's on the case. Like he's going to crack this fucking case. Sure. The good news for <laughs> us and for the Scooby Squad here is that he somehow has a security pass for a door to a mental institution. Uh, Do they just hand those out to all the deputies in case they need to go in and out of that joint? Yeah, he just walked right in there, didn't he? He got that key key. at the uh, rap party for Dead Man on Campus. You didn't know that? (laughs) They handed it out to everyone. He has one. Mark Paul Gossler has one. It's crazy. Oh, okay. Maybe he used it again when when he's in uh, Space Puppies. Yes. Um. My favorite performance of his. So the security guard sees this dot uh, on on the the view screen and he goes to investigate it. And he (laughs) has a very odd way of holding a gun. It's like the first time he's he's held a gun. (laughs) Yeah. It looks like he's handling scissors and giving them to a preschooler. (laughs) Not a firearm. He's kind of cradling the front part of it, which is not a good move because Don't that gets that. very hot and has a projectile come out of it. That's how guns work, everyone. <laughs> Fun but, fact, that's how guns work. <laughs> yeah. Well, listen, I don't know a lot, but I know that bullets come out of one end of that fucking thing and don't hold your hand near it. So it turns out that Jason has followed these teens to this men's mental institution. Why? Because they're teens. That's not. But give off that teen scent he can track. Here's the me. Here's a, here's a problem. And this this movie is drinking its own Kool Aid about Friday the Thirteenth. Friday the Thirteenth is not a teen based franchise. Outside of Part Eight, where people are graduating high school, the other movies don't contain. Teens. Yeah, they're all they 20 somethings. Young adults. So he's not, and and also, he, the, none of them have a fuck style to pick up on in this, <laughs> which is his real secret weapon that he knows your fuck style and uses it against you. So I don't know exact, unless he's continuing to get information fed to him by Freddy, who is aware of these children's movements, even though none of them are asleep. I don't, I don't, I cannot explain how he arrives at this location other than the movie needs him to do it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that's, that's your explanation right there. Yeah. You know, as, as the saying goes, because the script declared it. Yes. 
So unfortunately, upon checking this door that Jason is trying to break down, Paul Blart point one point oh, <laughs> uh, unfortunately meets his end. R.I.P.D. Immortan Blart. I gotta say, uh, it's rare that you don't see the kill in this series. Yes, we only get the aftermath. You just see the aftermath here, which I kind of like. Honestly, it's I mean, I don't know what we would necessarily gain from a door smashing. I don't know. A couple more thousand dollars in the budget. That's what you would have because you'd have like limbs flying and shit. (laughs) I guess I think I think we see a a more uh, spectacular death in just a few minutes. Hell yeah, we do. I think they were they were reserving it for that. But it is at this point in the movie that Will, Laurie and Kia discover a room straight out of 1978's coma where uh, the ones who wouldn't stop dreaming, quote unquote, are kept. These people are in some sort of chemical coma. They won't stop dreaming. So why is why is it Freddy just picking these people off? Right? Easy. Like, but what do you care for easy? Like, do you score more points? Fred we likes don't... a challenge when he's uh, <laughs> trying to appease those snake demons from part six. <laughs> I don't think this movie has paid attention to any part of Freddy's dead. It just has ignored that altogether. They do not, they do not comport. They're not in the same universe any more than this movie is in the same line as uh, Friday the third, Jason X. It just ignores it. You just (laughs) cannot put those things next to one another. But it turns out that Lori's dad is the one who's been over prescribing hypnosil to all these people and has sent them into comas. And I think he may have the highest body count of any of the villains in this movie, and that's saying something. Well, they're not technically dead, although of course, you know, the 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 you know the idea they probably have plenty of you know bodies you know, buried in the uh in the potter's field behind the hospital. <laughs> is, uh, you know, that that's you know not with it not not outside the, the realm of possibility. I mean and, no and, one is and, asking about them. And again, uh, like the still you know the, the business model of this hospital still makes no sense to me. And and I don't think I, I, I don't think I will I, you know by the end by the time we get to the end of this movie, I, I will come to understand it. <laughs> because either these parents are okay with this or or they've been, you know, disappearified. Um <laughs> Because nobody's asking questions. There, there isn't any sort of like journalistic expose over, you know, how did some 85 teenagers in, the, in this in this local, you know, this very contained area just up and disappear one day. So, I mean, we don't know who's paying for this ho- these hospital stays. Yeah. You know, or or, or the what, this, what the continued this? source of income is. Right. You know, how like, are they keeping the lights on? Like a, 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 a tech CEO funding it? Or is it like a private think tank? Or is it a drug developer? Like, where's the money coming from? Where? How is this greasing the wheels? We're back in the Friday the 13th. It's the government. And Nightmare on Elm Street remake thing where the town is secretly funded somehow by the villain. It's a very weird setup i just don't understand how it and, works and i don't understand how kidnapping forcing some of them into a coma and possibly almost certainly killing a few of them in the process whether accidentally or otherwise is supposed to protect them at the same time because <laughs> all it takes is two doofuses to go hey everybody you ever heard of freddy and the whole fucking <laughs> gig is up i was saying i do like the fact that this does keep with the theme of the entire nightmare on elm street series that the parents are the real villains. Oh, for sure. For sure. Because in every Freddy movie, the parents are the worst. Like, in all of these. So much gaslighting. And even when, like, the, the parents have redemption, like, um, what's her name's mom? Uh, Alice's mom in, uh, I guess it's four, dad in four or five. Four, I think it was. He becomes a good person, but then, like, even his life still goes to shit because he was awful. Well, he still tries to sell her baby out from underneath her. Oh, like, yeah, that did it, happen. It does not exactly put him... I mean, yeah, he's not drinking. At but least he's he stopped also, drinking. <laughs> like, so he's so he checked that one thing off the list. Yeah. But he's super into unborn baby selling. That is that is still on his okay side of his <laughs> uh, equation for whatever reason. Uh, speaking of people who don't have their priorities in order... Let's talk about Freebird. Um, yeah. He's smoking a doobie. Of course uh, he and is. Then all, and then all of a sudden, wait, what? 
do you hear that? Is that freedom rock? Well, turn it up, man. <laughs> it just, the, again, like New Line's idea of, of drugs is so fucking weird. Like you live in Los Angeles. Talk to somebody who smoked pot. It is so weird what this movie's concept of what drugs do are. It, it, it treats it like like he's on heroin and he has to stop everything to get his next fix. It's Fuck. like it's, it's like you got you guys go find the 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 you know the supernatural murderer. I'm gonna i I'm gonna I'm gonna sit back here and light up, bro. Bob <laughs> Shea's a weird guy. All right. I, I feel like he doesn't know how humans work and he has a lot of notes for every filmmaker when if they try to do something real. He's like, no, 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 this is how it would happen. And they just have to no, listen they, to Bob Shea. They love the supernatural over there. Uh, he, he enjoys the supernatural because he's under the belief that giving actresses long, wet, unwanted kisses is okay. Ugh. So magical thinking's high on his priority list. So Freddie um, also is a person who has historically not understood how drugs work. <laughs> uh, we've seen it time and time again. But here he appears as the caterpillar a la Alice in Wonderland. Oh, but he dreadful kind of looks more like that burnt oven mitt from the 1983 3D movie Parasite. <laughs> you ever seen that? <laughs> it's just like a it's a burnt slug that just kind of like pops out at you. It's got a lot of teeth. Anyways, the CGI here is a little poor. I'd say on the scale, <laughs> uh, on the scale of things, the dancing baby and Ally McBeal may have been rendered better on screen, without a doubt. When it when it jumped down and it, when it like kind of went into his mouth, you know what it reminded me of? Remember in um, Poltergeist Two yeah. when uh, Craig T. Nelson dr- a- a- accidentally swallows the the worm in, in the tequila bottle? It's disgusting. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, like, he just barfs it up, but it's, like, like uh, 100 times bigger. It just yeah. reminded me of that, but, like, reverse. <laughs> and, but at least in that, they're like, hey, his mouth has to get bigger for this slime worm to get out of it. Here, they're like, oh, no, no, no. The cat, the Fredipillar just uh, gets tiny. It just squeezes <laughs> on in there. <laughs> just, just contracts its just body. Wiggles its way right in there. Do, 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 do. I'm going to... I'm going to hold in my breath <laughs> and just squiggles on down, just gets on its little tiny bug knees. And Disgusting. Like what if, <laughs> what did Freddie need to like, you know, get someone high with a, a incredibly powerful drug to, in order to possess them? I don't know. He didn't need to, pos- he didn't need to drug anybody in part two. It's just like, you you like the allure of gay sex? We all do. <laughs> Let me get in your body. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> from, from everything I've heard, it's awesome. Let's get in this and do it. Get in your friend's bedroom. He's got very <laughs> slick looking sheets. Let's make some things happen. <laughs> I will say, though, even though it the, the worm looks like ass and it's just like dreadful, bad CGI. I like that. It's a callback to old school, like Freddy, like turning into things. Yeah. Yes. Uh, it's it's like a it's, very low rent version of the giant snake from dream warriors. And yes. so I can get behind it on that, that level, but it does not look good. Like even compared to like CGI of the time, like it's no, it's bad. I remember opening night spending a bunch of dough opening night. This, that part got booed. <laughs> That's unfortunate because I think a callback to part three and part two, especially part two, like, yeah, man, Freddie's back in the habit, like whoopee, like he's doing <laughs> some old school stuff. But this somehow now Freddie's under the possession, uh, Freeberg's under the possession of Freddie and he starts dumping uh, drugs down the drain, which <laughs> we get to see from inside the drain just in case you weren't sure what was happening. a little bit of a panic room i think uh fincher stole that shot from this <laughs> yes i can see him going i can do that <laughs> but better and not weird i'll make it look good all right <laughs> <laughs> and i'll do 50 takes until i get it right mm-hmm. here not so much uh let's cut to linderman and Stubbs. um they uh go back into the computer room and they find freeberg dumping the drugs but they're interrupted by Jason, who takes a wild downward swing with his machete it's and ends up electrocuting himself when he cuts <laughs> into a computer. <laughs> <laughs> he, 
he he kills a computer uh, and then gets zappified for a very long time, which, as we all know, doesn't really stop Jason because he was reborn by God lightning. Like he was brought back by uh, electricity in part eight. Like that's he that doesn't really keep him down. Uh, and it doesn't here. So he grabs stubs <laughs> and now his second time transferring electricity. We saw it when he sidestepped out of the way in part three. Um, I can't remember what that guy's name was. He didn't wear shoes and he went to, into an outhouse without shoes. And then he went into a leaky basement without shoes. He was just like a weird fucking guy. Oh, that, Anyways, uh, that was Chuck. Chuck. Hey, you can't go down there with no shoes. You get trench foot. Do that. Oh God! Man. I think I think all Chuck was was trench foot, <laughs> toes <laughs> to the top of his head. There's a lot going on there, but uh, unfortunately, uh, that amount of lightning is not, or electricity rather, is not something that Stubbs can handle, and his tips get finally frosted <laughs> into heaven. Uh, R.I.P.D. I, I, I do Stubbs. like I do like Jason's uh, ingenuity, and and well, I'm stuck here with my machete in this computer. Might as well just use this electricity while I'm here. <laughs> yeah. No, he's, we know from our history of, of watching Friday the 13th movies, he uses what's around. In, in the parlance, he uses the whole buffalo. Yes. Even if that buffalo is arcing electricity out of a computer you just killed. So Hell yeah. He's, he's very, you know, he's, he, smart. he's very hands-on. And people yeah. don't think he's smart, but I think he is. He, he knows what's he, up. He's not book smart. He's um, kill people smart. Street smart. He's got those street, street smart. smart. <laughs> I just love how much he doesn't care in this movie. Like, oh, I'm being electrocuted? Eat me. How about this? <laughs> how about this? You are the dead man on campus, Stubbs. We do this now. We're referencing this, that a lot. It's a good movie. People should watch it. <laughs> um, this uh, prompts what I think might be my favorite line in this section of the movie, where I genuinely laughed out loud in spite of myself. And that is when all the lights in the entire uh, Weston Hills Institute go off because of the electric electrical surge. And Lori goes, well, what was that? <laughs> uh, the lights, Lori, <laughs> the, the lights were turned off. <laughs> that's, that's what that is. They're lights. Okay. I do like, I do like, uh, um, Linderman's like nice girly scream during the scene. It's pretty great. <laughs> oh, it's precious. <laughs> his his rage knows no bounds, and it is untethered. Um, he just he just needs the 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 impetus to let it go. Uh, he beats feet. He picks up a gun on his way out. Uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, free Fredberg because he's Freeberg and Freddy. So let's make him Fredberg. Sure. He feels two of these comically large syringes that we were talking yes. about earlier with what I, what would, what appears to be bubble gum flavored Tylenol. Hell yeah. I was going to say, it looks like that stuff they used to give us as kids when we get ear infections. <laughs> I think that's what it, it is. It did not taste good, uh, by the way. <laughs> no, it definitely didn't taste like bubble gum. I'll tell you that right now. Yeah. What do these people uh, think bubble gum tastes like? I Like <laughs> what planet are these people on that? They're like, yeah, that tastes like bubble gum. It'll trick kids. No, it's not. <laughs> It tastes like death. No. <laughs> now, my child's never fooled. He also does, does not like bubble gum, so that doesn't help him. I mean, he doesn't like any of it. So when it comes down, and nor do I really want him to like the taste of medicine. That's the other part, is that it shouldn't be that great a taste. Yeah, honestly, you shouldn't like the taste of medicine. <laughs> no. <laughs> I mean, sure, I like the taste of, you know, the tropical fruit Tums, but that's because I need them to live. <laughs> Um, so he, uh, decides to put those syringes behind his back and lure Jason towards him. So good. Uh, he also calls Will bitch at one point because yes. uh, he's... Freddie's fucking addicted to the word bitch. So like, otherwise, how do we know? Yeah, we wouldn't know. We wouldn't know he's possessed by Freddie otherwise. Uh, and how would Will know? Because he, d he's never actually met Freddie. So how the fuck would he know either? Who cares? Anyways. Jason walks straight towards Fredberg and Fredberg nails him on either side of his neck with these giant uh, syringes, plunges them down, and Jason chops Fredberg in half. 
It's pretty. Um, it's pretty bitching. It's glorious. It's, it's practical effects, everybody. Yeah. And oof. I love this kill, <laughs> and it's great because it's a character I hate. <laughs> Yeah, uh, he really takes him to town. Uh, and uh, so then uh, Lin- Linderman walks into the room, screams his banshee scream, <laughs> but it's all for naught. He never gets to shoot the gun because Jason just just plops over because he's been drugged because he has a central nervous system in uh, blood. Apparently, that, I, I didn't know circulates. you could. I didn't know you could you tranquilize a dead person. Yeah, that's you can now. A, <laughs> you can my, my, tranquilize my, this one. My favorite part uh, as we get into a, a, a somewhat lengthy fight scene between uh, Jason and Freddy is how you can hear Freddy's voice. You, know, you could hear like a uh, you know, him speaking to, and Lori kind of cocks her head a little bit like a dog. Like I'm like I'm like, can she hear this? It's very weird. Like she looks like she looks like what? What? And then it like and then like cuts over to like everything. Everything's in a red filter, and and Jason's back in the basement and being yelled at by his mom. Yeah, somehow she's now connected to Jason in some. Way. I, I have a I, lot of questions I, about <laughs> this scene. My most my the most pressing question is: Has it ever been established? And up to this point, that Jason is afraid of water. No, no. Um, I, I no. thought not, because otherwise he would not be able to walk from Crystal Lake to New York City underwater. <laughs> well, didn't he get? Didn't he get freaked out when he was fighting uh, the psychic in Part Seven by the water? Well, he. I don't want to say I think he's freaked he out. He's probably more freaked out, out by she's her. Able to. He, yeah, he's okay. way more freaked he, he, out. But by in her. this scene, he, there's a, maybe about enough water coming down to maybe. A heavy rainstorm. Yeah, and, and he's just like, <laughs> I can't do it. I'm just like, tremble. he's having a panic attack, <laughs> like- which is crazy because when he came back to life in part six, it was pouring out. Yeah, right. No, he's always walking have, around in the fucking rain. He should be able to operate. He should have just con- jumped back into the grave back then, he, right? He is constantly exposed to water, and he, and now in this all of a sudden, movie, now, he walked around in the rain. Where does he think he that lives water in a comes place from? called Crystal Lake? Lake. He walked. He he walked in the ocean somehow. <laughs> not not like on top, like Jesus underneath. And no, now, like, like a real Jesus. That's how. A, <laughs> that's how a Jesus of the streets does it. Down and, underneath where the real fish are. And now, and, and now, some simulated rain, some simulated water pouring for a ceiling has him absolutely paralyzed with fear. It makes zero fucking sense. And it's just like a thin little stream, like it's a decorative waterfall at a tiki-themed restaurant. For a second, when he wouldn't walk through it, I'm like, what's he supposed to be a vampire now? He can't cross running water? <laughs> yeah, it's like Rainforest Cafe. That's just scares him. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, I was like, oh, he's afraid of it? Okay. Yeah. That that's new information. I mean, let's let's give uh, Friday, let's give the Friday, Friday the Thirteenth movies their due. He is neutralized when contained within Crystal Lake, but that doesn't mean he's afraid of it. And here, somehow, because it's in the nightmare realm, maybe, maybe it, again, I don't know why his emotions come into it because we've never seen Jason Voorhees be particularly emotional outside of anger. Anger that that psychic girl can electrocute him he, and set him on fire. That's the only time we've seen emotion. I out think of I, him. yeah, he cried once. I think, <laughs> but that was when he was like dying in part eight. Yeah, he was he, like a he, crying he becomes little a child. jelly baby at the end. Well, he yeah, does that. He, they do that here too, and and you get to see Freddy basically taunting and torturing a disabled child. It's which horrible. Is, which, is, which is weird and uncomfortable to watch. <laughs> Again, uh, Freddie is allowed apparently just to be a random asshole <laughs> instead of <laughs> kind of a thing. dream demon who who haunts your dreams. Like this isn't even feel good, Freddie. This is just Freddie being an ass. Like yeah, this is not fun, Freddie. Uh, at one point, he gives uh, Jason the jerk off motion. Yeah, which, like what the fuck? okay, that made me cackle. Actually, that that was brilliant. <laughs> 
<laughs> eh, you with your machete. That's that's just yeah. It's just Robert Englund going. Okay, I'm probably not going to play this character ever again. Can I go balls out and just go insane? <laughs> Can I do every stupid little catchphrase and thing I've always wanted to do? Yeah, sure, Rob. It's fine. Just just do it. Yeah, he also apparently in one point in this scene bounces Jason around as if he's playing a pinball game with his hips. Hell yes. Which, uh, he's a pinball wizard, <laughs> apparently. So on the list of things I don't want to see, Yoda <laughs> fight with a lightsaber and Freddy used the force. I just don't want to see either of those things. And this this movie confront makes me confront one of them. And I'm not happy about it. I don't want to see him hip thrust someone <laughs> into a pipe. It's very oddly sexual. And then he makes uh, steel plates fly. I was like, what the fuck is this about? <laughs> like, uh, I guess because we have to give them weaknesses and strengths. Like, we have to have have some way to equalize Freddy versus Jason because in a real-world fight, it's comically overpowered towards Jason, who we are told in this movie is fucking immortal. What is any of this doing? And at at one point, Freddy's like, why the fuck won't you die? It's like, you know why he won't die because he's immortal. Because through a Voorhees was he born, through a Voorhees will he be reborn, right? Uh, no, 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 no. We do not bring in Tinkerbell magic knives into this movie. Thank you very much. There's a small baby put into a box in that movie. We're not okay with it. It is exceedingly blue, and it certainly is interesting, and I don't know why a bounty hunter needs to break your fingers in jail and kind of like it. but Because he's Creighton uh, Duke, anyway. damn it. <laughs> They're very much... It is very true. So, uh, and, and we get this fucking water thing, and then Freddy mind melds with Jason <laughs> like Spock. It's so good. And is able to <laughs> go into the past. But he mind melds through, like, you know, poking his brain with the knife. Yeah. He, he mind melds by uh, puncturing. Yes. <laughs> Jesus. Stabbing a child in the brain. Why not? Stabbing a child in the brain. Because, oh. Anyways, so now we're into Jason's dream. Oh, the other question I had is, uh, Jason finds himself in uh, one of Freddy's boiler rooms. Do you think Jason ever saw a boiler room before in his life? Like, does he know what the fuck that is? Oh, he has no idea what's going on. No, no. (laughs) Okay. He's like, what is this? What is this place? Uh, Well, we're going to go to where Jason feels most comfortable. Um, Let me uh, clear up the pipes here. Muck shake, baby! That's right. The sign says, stay away, fools, because love rules at the muck shack. <laughs> Fingers crossed for a toilet. Um, This is, we don't usually get to see where Jason lives, but here we get to see his famous shack, now apparently on an island with exposed heads. How Rococo. So uh, Jason walks into his muck shack, and he's dragging a dead body behind him. We see that <laughs> Freddy says, I want to see what, what skeletons are in your closet. And Jason immediately goes to a closet, <laughs> which has a spare mask hanging <laughs> on the closet door. I shit you not. Does he also have a laundry hamper in there? He, he doesn't live like a fucking human being. Kill, but make it fashion. What is this shit? Like, it was weird when he had a toilet. It's even weirder that he has spare masks hanging on a closet because putting it on the ground would be wrong. Well, you got to make sure you, you have an extra in case your your other one's at the cleaners. <laughs> just, just in case he sent it to the dry cleaner and he said it'd be ready by Thursday. But oh, lo and behold, Friday rolls around. You know, what are you going to do? Yeah. Okay. That makes... He can't just go out with that mug in public. <laughs> Ugh. Can't take him anywhere. Especially if he's riding the rails or walking from New Jersey to Ohio, as we all do. Yeah, speaking um, of uh, New Jersey, or rather Ohio to New Jersey, while all this is taking place, apparently a conversation takes place between the living characters that yes. ends with them agreeing to put Jason in the back of their van. How did they get him there? That guy weighs 450 pounds. This makes even less sense than 
the plan at the end of the Friday the 13th remake in which, well, we can't just leave his, you know, his, his half severed head, you know, stuck in this, you know, this potato grating machine or whatever the hell it was. <laughs> yeah. No, we're going to painstakingly drag his corpse down to the, the lake for some reason. <laughs> We're, we're, we're going to stick around this, this you know, this, this otherworldly killer as long as possible. Hey, here's an idea. Here's an even better idea. Let's get stuck in a van with him. <laughs> Very enclosed space. Small enclosed space. Yes. We'll, have, we'll have him wrapped up in duct tape. It'll be fine. Nothing will happen. <laughs> There's duct no tape. way he can get out of duct tape. Come on. He punched through a steel door. There's no way he's getting through duct tape, Gina. That's just that just makes sense. I, I, I just love that the they copped out of showing you know who came up with this idea, and how long <laughs> like, it took everybody to to agree with it. <laughs> did they get a wheelchair and take him down <laughs> in the elevator? Like I want to see how that did they scene. get him there? Yeah, and that was on the second fucking floor of the Weston Institute. So they got him not only down a flight of stairs but out to their boogie van. And have strapped him up and are now keeping him drugged up. Somehow a dead man drugged up with children's bubblegum Tylenol. (laughs) Oh, and unfortunately, that is where we must stop. Um, Oh, they uh, just just like Will does in the middle of their drive in which he's just been told, hey, we only have enough drugs to keep him down for just like a couple minutes. It's like, great. Let me stop our journey and let's have a discussion about something. <laughs> it's time for us to stop and have a discussion called Choose Your Own Death Venture. And that's where we decide of the deaths portrayed in this section of the movie, which one would you choose and why? Up for bid for this episode, we have chopped in half by a machete, electrocuted to death by a, a punctured computer electricity, or you can have a Freddy a bug crawl down your mouth. Or um, who else? Do- oh, yeah, you get crushed by a steel door. I, I think I think that's everything. Yeah, I'm, I'm not I'm not really going to count death by coma because that's that's too easy. <laughs> so, um, Matt, um, as our guest, I turn to you for your answer first. Crush me with a door, please. It'll be quick. <laughs> <laughs> There's really no guarantee that that will be quick. It looks heavy, I mean, though. Um, oh, that door! That, that door heavy. is heavy as hell. That's a heavy <laughs> door. Um, crush me, please. <laughs> okay. Now you're gonna have to shave your head, and you're also gonna have to wear that kind of mascara around. It's all fine. The time, I'll shave which... my head. I'll grow a mustache out. It's perfect. I'll do okay. this. <laughs> all right. Not everyone can carry off uh, a, an eyeliner look like this gentleman does, the security guard. So you know, I'm just letting you know. I got this. <laughs> okay. I trust you implicitly. Gina, what say you? I too. I, I think I would prefer just to be smushed by a door. It, 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 just, seem, it just seems to be a, a, a relatively quick and mostly pain-free way to go. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, in terms of pain-free, absolutely. But I do think there's something romantic about being joined in electricity with Jason Voorhees. <laughs> and it, the, the siren call of that is just too much for me to ignore. I definitely don't want to be cut in half, no matter how high that bug got me. So, yeah, I'm, I'm choosing to go out by lightning. And that pretty much does it uh, for this episode. But before we go, uh, Matt, why don't you tell everyone where people can find you on on social media and whatnot and what you're up to. Hey, uh, yeah, you can find me online, basically any social media at the real Matt C. Uh, you can find me over at, uh, talk film society where I'm the editor at large. A lot of fun stuff happens over there. And you can hear me on monsters never die. It's a, uh, monster podcast that I co-host with my friend, Jacob DeNoble. And we talk about, it started out talking about the original universal monster movies, their remakes and ripoffs. And we've basically sprouted off to do, just horror in general, but different types of horror monsters. So stay tuned next month. We're going to be covering the entire fly series. So that'll be fun. Oh, excellent. Oh boy. When you get to the end of that, you get to see uh dog corpses and a guy turned into a goo monster. It's oh, it's, and he gets to eat out of a bowl. It's fantastic. I've never seen it. I'm very excited to see that one. 
Oh man, there, there's a guy uh, rips off his face. It's fantastic. Hell yeah, you're gonna love it. Makes no fucking sense whatsoever. <laughs> Gina, uh, where can people find you on these here internets? I am a writer uh, about mostly focusing on TV and movies at thespool.net. I am also on Twitter under porcelain72. Do it today, people. Check it out. And of course, you can find us on Twitter at killbykillpod. You can email us at uh, uh, killbykillpod at gmail.com. We're on Instagram and we have a Facebook page and group, of course, where you connect with us and talk about uh, these movies in more detail there. And that just about does it for today. Don't worry, folks. The body count will continue. In the next episode, we will conclude our journey through Freddy versus Jason. It is the ultimate episode. It has been four years in the making. We've got a great guest. We've got plenty to talk about, and it's all super fucking weird. Uh, and so for myself, for Gina, for Matt, bye-bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.